Hello, everyone, and welcome to another event of Tech Bytes. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Tech Bytes is a speaker series where we host both internal and external speakers for doing a deep dive on tech-related uh, topics. Um, uh, the knowledge, the sharing of knowledge for both internally at Spotify and externally as well. Today, we have an external speaker, Eric Wastel, who's going to talk about Advent of Code. We hope you enjoyed the talk, and without further delay, let's welcome Eric to the stage. So before we start, quick show of hands. Uh, how many people have even heard of Advent of Code before? Almost all of you. How many people have solved at least one puzzle? How many people have solved a whole, all of the puzzles from one year? One. Have you solved all of them? From every year? Well done. A couple hundred people in the world have done that. That's incredible. That's really, 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 really rare. Anyway, hi, I'm Eric Wastel. Uh, this is Advent of Code Behind the Scenes. So who let this guy on stage anyway? Uh, in this case, you guys did. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Spotify. Uh, so I used to make large-scale web applications for ISPs. I recently switched jobs. Now I work on infrastructure for an auction system that handles uh, moving cars between dealerships in the United States. It's, it's really interesting work. They're growing really quickly, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, I also run programming challenges, advent of code. I uh, also make tools for games uh, in order. These are EVE Online, League of Legends, Minecraft, and World of Warcraft. Uh, I also make fun of programming languages. If you've been to these websites, this is me being snarky instead of me trying to teach people stuff, which is an important outlet for teaching people stuff. Uh, and I make lots of other random things, but we're not here to talk about those. We're going to talk about advent of code. So what's advent of code? What's going on here? Okay, let me back up a little bit. Suppose you are here. Oh, sorry, that's, that's zoomed out. Hang on, let me, let me just zoom in a little. There, okay, sorry, yeah. What if you're here at this table at a little cafe in Salem, Massachusetts with some friends who really like Halloween and you're hanging out there and, and uh, talking about what other cool projects you could work on? Near Halloween, by the way, so this is f five weeks from uh, December 1st when the puzzles would have to come out if I were to about to come up with the idea for Advent of Code, not saying I am. And all you have is a pen, a few napkins, a few weeks until Christmas, a random memory of Advent calendars from your childhood, and a passion for programming puzzles and helping people learn to become better programmers. The answer, of course, Advent of Code. Combination of Advent calendars and programming puzzles. So Advent calendars, people aren't always familiar. An Advent calendar is uh, a box that looks something like this. It's a countdown until Christmas, and every day, traditionally, they have a small toy or a piece of chocolate or something like that behind each door. So on the first day you open, you get a chocolate. On the second day you open, you get a chocolate. Uh, and then on, on Christmas, you might get a bigger prize. You might get something else. And it's a way to, to count down until Christmas. Uh, when I was growing up, my advent calendar looked like this. You take the little ornaments out of the pockets and you put them up on the tree and it's reusable and it's fun. Um, advent of code advent calendars look like these. Or like this. Or like this. Uh, but where are the programming puzzles? Well, they're here. So every line of the, po of the advent calendar, every, every line of this picture, contains a programming puzzle. And if you click on it, it opens up every day. A new one unlocks, just like a normal advent calendar. But instead of getting chocolate or a toy, you get a ridiculous story about Santa and elves, and they go on some preposterous adventure. And eventually it says, hey, you know, in order to save the day, rescue whoever, do the thing, uh, you have to solve this peculiar problem. And every puzzle includes an input, and you click the link, and you get some kind of an input, and you feed it into this thing that you've constructed for that day, and then when you finally solve the puzzle, you get an answer, and you put it into that box, and when you're done, it takes you to part two. And part two has some other wacky stuff in it that continues on with the same puzzle and the same input. And now all of a sudden, you have to build some other wacky thing and solve it. And when you finally finish that, you get two stars. And as you do more of them, you finish more parts of the advent calendar, and it slowly fills in, until by the end of it, you have a blue mug floating off in space for reasons that are spoilers, unless you've done last year's puzzles, which I recommend because it's hilarious. Uh, so, it's 2015, and you just built a bunch of programming puzzles because you thought of this weird idea in a cafe in Salem, Massachusetts. Where should we host this thing? Uh, anybody here familiar with, like, scaling and infrastructure? I know Spotify isn't that big, so you don't have a lot of servers. Yeah, a couple of you, good. How should we host this thing? All right, let's do some, some planning. Let's do some estimation. Estimation is an important, an important skill for any engineer. Programming puzzles probably won't be that popular. All right. But I have a few friends that might like it. You know, I've, I've done some projects like this before. They have a few friends that might like it. So if you have 50 people, we'll figure about 50 people will do it. 
uh, let's call it 70. Because, you know, have a little bit of margin, like have a margin of error. So we'll give it a wide margin, 70 people. Small personal web server covered just fine. Great. Easy, easy problem. Finish all the puzzles. It's November 30th, 2015. It's time to launch the site. We built all the puzzles. We got on a small personal web server. And uh, I announce it to the world. And I say, okay, my secret project is done. I haven't told any, but even my friends don't know I'm doing this. And I say, hey, surprise, there's a thing coming. It's in two hours. You should click this link. And I get 27 retweets. Great, that's within margins. Uh, okay, so I send that tweet, 27 retweets. A couple people sign up. Uh, it starts at November 30th at about 2 in the afternoon. And on the end there is unlock. Midnight the next day. Uh, so that's, that's my estimate there, 70 users. Above there is my uh, actual number of people that had signed up right at midnight, 81. That's a little high, but it's still within tolerances. I'm sure it'll be fine. But then the puzzle unlocked. And the graph did this. And as you're all aware, being engineers, you know the technical term for graph that's shaped like this, which is, oh no! <laughs> so 12 hours later, the graph is gone. It has left. My estimate is down there. Uh, let me zoom out a little bit. That's where the graph is going. Uh, that's 4,000 people. This has only been 12 hours after unlock, and all of a sudden the graph is doing this. This is a bad shape for your graph to have. Uh, so let's do, let's do some, uh, some, some hypothesis testing here. We figured 70. We got 4,000. That's 5,600% error. Uh, small server is very sad. So you're bad at traffic estimation. Now what? The, the CPU is high, the memory is running out, the database is having trouble handling all the queries. This part's interactive, what do you do? You don't have time to move to AWS. The, the event's already running, there's no way. How about turn off the Minecraft server? Now the poor server's doing a lot better because that's what was using all the resources. Uh, second thing you do, don't create a new process for every request. Now hang on, why would you do that, what? So, an easy way to build stuff, especially for prototyping, is to use CGI, Common Gateway Interface. In CGI, in, in, it relies upon typical Unix uh, philosophy of having a process that has a couple standard inputs and standard outputs. So in this case, you have environment variables and standard in that come in. You have standard output and standard error that go out. In CGI, these are mapped to the headers and the request body coming in, the HTTP response and the logs coming out. And sometimes it talks to a database and does some other stuff, right? In CGI, it does this for every request. Uh, which is not ideal if you're getting that many users. So 70 users, no problem. 4,000 users don't, don't use CGI. Fortunately, I just, in a panic, switched it to fast CGI instead, which simply doesn't restart the process, and th that helped a lot too. Server was still really sad, but at least it was keeping up with traffic, barely. So now we're 24 hours since unlock, and the graph is still doing this. That's now 9,000 people, over 9,000 even. Uh, so hang on, where did all these people come from? We, we, we estimated a couple, we got 27 retweets, what's going on? Uh, does anybody see the flaw in my reasoning here? This part that I've highlighted, uh, it's, it's recursive. And the next day I log on to Twitter and Twitter looks like this. Everybody's friends, 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 friends liked it too. And all of a sudden, this thing explodes. So 48 hours since unlock, we're already up to 15,000 people. We'll fast forward a little bit. That's the final graph for the first year. We ended up with 52,000 people. We expected seven, well, we expected 50 and had a margin of 70. What did we do after that? We switched to Amazon Web Servers. <laughs> Which was great, because then instead of uh, panicking, I could just throw money at it like a real business and it would go away, it's great. Uh, so today we've got a, a third of a million people and it's still growing every year by an enormous amount. So uh, AWS, very handy. <laughs> okay, so why do people do advent of code? What is this all about? Um, so one of the big tricks, especially with having an audience of this size with something that's so uh, personal and so interactive and that people invest so much time into is that people have lots of different reasons for doing these. Uh, people use them for practice problems if they just want to sharpen their skills on something. Um, people use them for interview preparation. There are companies that ask questions during interviews that are like advent of code problems. Uh, people use these and do better at their interviews as a result. At least that's what they tell me. Uh, you see people doing these for company trainings 
where a company will take a Friday afternoon off or something and sit in a conference room and, and work on the puzzles together with each other. Uh, a couple people at midnight every night use them as a speed contest. I don't recommend this, but they seem to have a lot of fun with it. More power to them. Or if you look at the subreddit, people challenging their friends with even harder versions of the puzzles, which is delightful. If anybody saw the puzzle that came out just today, one of the beta testers released a significantly harder version of it. I suggest you check it out. Uh, it's a time. Okay, so who are all these people? Who's actually doing this stuff? Well, this is a, a map of all of the traffic that I get. It's basically a map of English-speaking countries because, you know, uh, a lot of people in the U.S., specifically California and New York State, uh, New York, where I'm from, they unlock at midnight. California have a little bit of an advantage. It locks, unlocks at 9 p.m. for them. Uh, Europe has it a little more rough, but, you know, that's when I can be around to watch the servers, so that's when they come out. But Europe uses this to their advantage. Sometimes it's part of their morning routine, like in this case where uh, this, this fine fellow is doing it while he's taking his morning shower, because why not? Or people that say, you know, waking up at 5 a.m. every day is not easy, but other people that say that they use it as their alarm clock, nothing else can wake me up as reliably as Advent of Code did this month, which, great, I guess. Uh, weird choice for an alarm clock, but more power to you. Uh, who does these things? Everybody in every language all over the place. This is a screenshot of GitHub back from a few months ago now. It's actually gone up from here, but every sort of language, every sort of paradigm interpreted and compiled functional and procedural, everybody does it. Uh, tens of thousands of repos on GitHub, and it's fascinating to page through them all and see all the different wacky solutions people come up with. Here's somebody that solved it on an FPGA. Uh, an FPGA is a circuit that you can tell to be a circuit. I don't know exactly how they work, but you can basically, it's a pr programmable hardware, uh, and they're solving the problem by building hardware that solves the problem, which is delightful to me. I love this. Or uh, big companies like Spotify, like Facebook London, where they posted the pictures of all their solutions right on the stairs so everybody walking down the stairs can see all their cool solutions. Or uh, universities, where they'll take all of their solutions every day and post them on the wall in their student alumni union for them to share. Or non-programmers, who get out enough graph paper to do 2016 day one, uh, which tells you, you know, turn right, go forward, turn right, go forward, turn left, go f whatever. And all of a sudden it says, okay, now turn right and go 550 squares forward. And they had to get out a couple more sheets of graph paper. I understand that they eventually got the right answer, but uh, not, not the fastest approach, at least. Uh, people that do it in Excel. Uh, this is uh, actually, a friend of mine who posts a lot of his Excel solutions on the subreddit when he has time to do them. This year has been a little busy. Um, but there have been a bunch of people that have been tackling them in Excel, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, or people that do them, you know, Google Sheets, that sort of thing. There's also somebody this year who, if you've been watching on the subreddit, has been solving the int code problems, the virtual machine problems using Excel. Not by having Excel run the virtual machine, but by building an a, a disassembler in Excel that actually lets him go through and figure out what all the instructions are, reverse engineer the whole puzzle, and then re-implement it using sheets and formulas in Excel, and no, not Visual Basic or anything, just formulas. And it's intense and super fun to read through his analyses of like how I did the ob obfuscation for a puzzle or those sorts of things. It's a really good read. Uh, go check those out if you haven't. Um, there was a puzzle last year, I think, where you had to figure out what order to build the sleigh in, like what order the parts had to go on to build the sleigh. And it said, you know, this thing has to happen before this one, and this one has to happen before this one. It's a topological sort. Um, you don't have to know that to solve the puzzle. You can just figure it out. This person's solution was to plug it into their, grant, their, their Gantt chart software and ask it what the answer is, <laughs> which worked just fine, and that's great. Uh, or people that solve it in Minecraft, or uh, there's been a couple of solutions uh, from Factorio, which if you haven't played, uh, do unless you like your free time. Uh, so let's talk about what it takes to design, to design these puzzles at all, because these are... A lot of fun, but there's so many neat things that go into them. So first I'd like to cover just what it takes to make a puzzle in general. Or really, secretly, what it takes to convey any complex topic, any complex concept in general. But, you know, th th things of, an, of a complex engineering nature like this. And I'll get into what I do specifically for Advent of Code next. So first, avoid ambiguity. Um, and ambiguity, especially with an audience the size that Advent of Code has, is really tricky to address because you have a lot of people where English isn't their first language or a lot of people that come from a non-CS background who you have to form sentences for that might make sense. Like, for example, if, if somebody from an English-speaking CS background knows that a noun is a noun, 
like a weird word that they can process as that, they'll read the sentence completely differently from somebody who says, I don't know what that word is, I'm going to skip it. Oh, now this part doesn't make sense because there's a conjunction. Like, just English problems, right? Just anything. Or multiple different ways that you could understand parts of the puzzle. Uh, and trying to avoid those, if at all possible, which is hard, and we try really, really hard to make it good, and it's, it's really difficult. I have a lot of beta testers, I have five beta testers, that go through the puzzles and just tell me if something is nuts so that I can try to fix it. I try to avoid expectations of outside information. There are a lot of people that haven't finished a four-year CS degree. There are a lot of people that haven't even programmed before that are doing these puzzles. So I can't just say like, hey, you know, take, uh, take ZFC set theory and assemble your set in this way and now do this kind of a union with this other set and what's the result? Like, I can't, I can't use those words, right? Because nobody knows what that is. I'd have to link to 85 Wikipedia articles and they would have to read through all of those because they did, like nobody would do the puzzles then. At least the target audience here being people that are trying to get better at programming. So I have to avoid a lot of terminology that would make the puzzle make more sense to experienced programmers so that it's accessible to beginning programmers, which has its own problems. Of it. um, avoiding the user to, or, or avoid requiring the user to make assumptions, except when that's part of the puzzle, which I try to avoid, except when it's hilarious. Um, this involves stuff like, if there's an important detail and I need to make sure that you get it, I'm going to highlight it and I'm going to put it in several different sentences in several different parts around the puzzle, hopefully, to try to make sure that you notice it at least once, because there are a lot of people that skim, and with the number of users that I have, there is a user who skipped any sentence in the puzzle. Like, given any sentence, I can find you a user that did not read only that sentence, and if the specific detail they needed was in that sentence, they missed it, and now they don't have it, and I need to have it either someplace else, or I need to have an easy way for them to find it again by skimming, by highlighted things, or stuff like that. Um, and finally, just have other people test it, have other people look at it. If you're building something complicated, the, the, the biggest fear that I have and, and the primary reason why I rely on beta testers is that it is trivial for me to come up with a puzzle that I have a cool idea for, design my solution, publish it, write the text that I think, relay, or that I think relays what I had in my brain for the puzzle and for it to be missing some key detail because I already understand the puzzle and writing it out in text without missing anything is really, really hard. So have other people look at it because my beta testers sometimes come back to me and they're like, hey, you didn't even describe what this word means. Like, ah, good, let's add a whole new paragraph for that or something, right? But it's, it's really easy to miss that stuff. So advent of code puzzles in particular now. Advent of code has uh, a couple interesting constraints, one of which is there's always exactly one answer for a given input. There's many inputs, but there's always only one thing you can type into the box to get the right value. Um, after a little bit of input normalization and stuff, but there's the, the, the important part, the semantically meaningful part of your answer, there's only one value. Um, and people are allowed to use any language. I only get an answer, I don't get their code, I don't get your, your notes, I don't get diagrams, I, j I don't get any of that stuff, I don't, get to, I don't get to run your code and test it for performance. Uh, I only get whether or not you got the answer or not, which has a lot of problems of its own, but it also lets people practice whatever programming language they want, including Excel, including graph paper. Uh, there are lots and lots and lots of inputs because I want to make sure that people don't just like get the answer to today's puzzle and they all type it in at once and all of a sudden the leaderboard fills up because somebody told everyone what the answer is. They'd at least have to like share their code or share their input or something and, and it keeps it a little bit more fair, hopefully. Um, all of the puzzles have two parts. When I set up Advent of Code originally, I decided to give them all two parts just because I thought it would be easier for me to pr produce more content without a lot more work. The, pu the, the, the second part was meant to just be like a twist or a harder version or something like that, um, but not that much more complicated of one. And instead what it's turned into is I've started to use them now for, part one is just like a checkpoint, like are you on the right track? Did you implement the, the, the details correctly in part one? And once I give you the star for that part, you know that the part that you built before is right, or at least it's, almost, it's probably right, depending on how I check it. And then part two can say, all right, now that you have a working apparatus, do this interesting thing with the thing that you've built. Here's, here's the interesting part of the puzzle. Or I'll have the first part of the puzzle be the interesting puzzle, and I'll have the second part be a giant change in requirements and say, hey, do it this way, and in fact, you have to completely rewrite your solution. Or maybe you don't. Maybe you predicted that I was going to do this wacky thing and you built your solution in a way that would anticipate this. But it simulates a, a, a real world change in requirements where you know, the product owner comes to you and said like, hey, th this thing needs to act differently now. And you have to, you have to respond to that in, in a way that actually lets your code still function. Um, I also strive for variety. Uh, 
largely to keep it interesting for everybody because there are so many different people with so many different backgrounds doing it at different times, at different skill levels, that just providing some variety means that if you don't like today's puzzle, that's fine. Like, you, uh, do, do tomorrow's, do, do yesterday's. They're all different. Um, and finally, difficulty calibration. I get a lot of questions about difficulty and how difficulty works and how scaling works and when I put certain puzzles when and stuff. Um, the, the, the short answer is that difficulty is extremely personal. It's extremely individual. If you're super good at analyzing, you know, having problems, you're really good at understanding regular expressions, you've got a deep understanding of math, different problems will be easy or impossible for you. So I try to do a lot of different things with the difficulty with the understanding that there are lots of different people with lots of different backgrounds doing these puzzles. Um, some of it is about pacing. I try to put uh, different puzzles at different times or I try to give people a, a precursor puzzle that's, you know, here is, here is the concepts that you're going to need later to approach the real problem I really wanted you to see. But here's a, a sampler of it. Here's something that everybody hopefully can wrap their brain around that will help them to figure out what it is that I'm trying to get at, what, what things you might want to research or look up, or, or what things you might want to prepare for. And then later on, I'll, pr I'll, I'll, I'll produce the harder version of that puzzle that uses those skills later on. Or uh, I know that people are, are less busy on weekends, so I might put harder puzzles there, or at least more time-consuming ones there, or things that I'm worried that people are going to get tripped up on and need to look things more up there, or something like that. Um, variety also for difficulty. Like I said, people have different skill levels or of different, uh, different skill sets, I mean, uh, giving them variety so that they don't get a bunch of the same thing they're bad at in a row, which would cause them to burn out very quickly. Uh, progression through the month, they gradually get more complex. Uh, random off difficulty puzzles, so this is important for pacing. It, it's a common complaint early on in the month that all the puzzles are too easy, and that, you know, it's just how fast can you type the answer and whatever, and it's a common complaint late in the month that all the puzzles are impossible and they're too hard, and it's just, you know, it's totally disjoint groups of people saying those things. And so I try to move a couple of the more interesting problems early and a couple of the easier problems late because then the hard people have something to do early on and the people that are struggling have a breather later on in them. So there's all of that sort of stuff. Um, and finally, interpreted versus compiled languages, especially for problems that are optimization questions where I say, hey, do this thing for 100 iterations. Great. Now do it for 100 quadrillion operations. If you're in a compiled language, you have an advantage. You have, you know, some order of magnitude advantage. It's not infinite. And so I have to make sure that any jump in complexity that I give doesn't give the compiled languages an advantage where they can have a less optimal solution and still get the right answer. For the problems where that's my goal anyway. For the problems where it's not, they might have a small advantage because they got it a little bit faster or whatever. But there's, there's a lot of different things that have to go into it. Um, so this is the general process for doing these. I get some inspiration from someplace. Usually it's from uh, the projects that I'm working on or things I see in the world or random things that I heard somebody talking about or something like that. Um, I do research into that topic uh, if I don't already, already understand it. Uh, I did try to design something that looks interesting and, and play with the problem until I get some kernel of interesting puzzle-ness. And then I try to wrap the puzzle around that. Um, I build an input generator, which is a script that just spits out input files, and some of them are not valid and some of them are good, and the input generator at any point is allowed to say like, hey, I give up, this puzzle is, or this input's never going to work, I need to start over, and my, my, my harness will say, oh, okay, this thing needs to be restarted, here you go, here's a new one. Um, solvers for both parts, which are also allowed to say those things. Uh, so each input is tested against my solvers, and all of my solvers look nothing like normal people's solvers because it has a ton of assertions that say, like, this input is too easy, this input is too hard, this input didn't hit all the edge cases that I need all the inputs to hit for them to be fair. Uh, or this input uh, reached an assertion that I didn't expect my generator to be able to make, and as a result, I violated some key assertion of the puzzle and it means that I did something wrong, stop everything I need to start over or anything in between. Um, and then I take those and I generate many inputs that all get the answers already solved uh, and then write the pros around the puzzle, which sometimes happen multiple times if I have to move a puzzle earlier or later after I'm done building it, the beta testers say, hey, this is super, super hard and it's on day seven, you have to move this later, like, okay. Uh, and then I'll rewrite the pros a couple times or change the story around a bunch or something, but that's the very, the very last step. Um, and while you might think that this is the process, this is the process, um, there's a lot of saying, oh, the part two of this problem doesn't make any sense at all, I need to go back, or this isn't going to work at all, I need to just shelf this problem, work onto something completely, or try something completely different, do a different problem, maybe I'll figure it out tomorrow or in the shower or whatever. Um, it's a very circuitous path to actually finishing any given puzzle. 
So here's some examples of puzzles. Here's one from last year. It says, there are a bunch of rectangles. How many square inches of fabric in this case? How many square inches of the rectangles are within two or more of them? How many of them overlap? So here's what they look like. Here's somebody drew a heat map of them. It says just how many, how many pixels, basically, are in more than one rectangle. And then it says, what is the ID number of the only rectangle that has no other overlapping rectangles? Uh, which, if you haven't spotted it yet, is there. Uh, or we get ones like this, where I really wanted to try to share log parsing type activities with programmers, because a lot of the people that are doing these puzzles are college students or aren't in a, in a software career of any sort, and log parsing is a handy skill to be able to do. So I wanted to build some kind of a puzzle that had to do with this. In this case, it was, you know, uh, transactional kinds of things like this guard has begun their shift, this guard has begun their shift, and you have to have state that you keep through it, and uh, the guard either wakes up or falls asleep, and you ask questions about when the guards are awake and when they're asleep. Uh, and so people love to do data analysis, and they'll draw all these graphs and pictures and stuff, and I love this sort of thing, because it's like here's a heat map of all of the guards and when they sleep, and how often they sleep, and when all of the overlaps are, and here's a line of when that guard has the most minutes of sleep, and, so, and it's super, super cool. And then you get other users who do animations of the puzzles, and when the guard falls asleep, he, you know, boop. Which I, you know, you, you, you can't not love it. It's great. Uh, here's a puzzle that I really, really enjoy, which is kind of a cellular automata and kind of a physics simulation and kind of some other stuff. I have an input that says, here is a list of walls in a vertical space. And I'm going to start pouring water into a specific point in this space. And the water is going to go and fill up all of the buckets. And I use ASCII art to render stuff. And I say, like, if the water falls, it'll land here, and it'll do these things, and then it'll fall like this, and here's how you should proceed. Other people take their whole solution, and they draw it out in these, in these wonderful giant uh, animations that show how everything fits together, which is both really fun to just look at, but also really helpful for all of the beginners that then tackle the problems during the day and get stuck on something and say, I really wish I could just see this in a way that was presented differently. And they can go on the subreddit and look at 50 different ways that somebody's thought to animate these things, which is a really, really good learning tool as well. Or you get puzzles like this one, where I give you what I claim is a regular expression that matches uh, legal paths through a maze. And it is a legal regular expression, but the problem is tuned in such a way that if you pass this to any regex engine, this problem will terminate in about 10 years. Like, you'll never, ever, ever get the answer. Um, and you approach it by making an extremely simple parser that treats this not as a regex, but as a sequence of steps that you can take with backtracking. And you secretly, I'm teaching you how to build a regular expression engine, but I don't tell you that ever. And people go through and they solve it. And they solve it by animating their algorithm actually, there it goes, by ha showing their algorithm actually working on this problem and getting the answer out by stepping through this gigantic maze of, you know, the North Pole base being constructed in 1815 or whatever the backstory for this puzzle was. Or you get this one, uh, which you guys might remember as being the puzzle that had the bug in it if you were awake exactly at midnight before I fixed it frantically. Um, where this one says, there are a whole bunch of points. Uh, fill outward from all of the points. How much space do they cover? How many of the, how many of the regions are infinite? Like, how do you measure an infinite region? Like, how do you figure out what, what the space is that's left over after you discount all of the infinite regions? And, and you have to find ways to approach that that let you actually solve this problem. I love asking questions about infinity because it forces people to come up with a different way to solve the problems. Um, this is a really, really fun cellular, cellular automata. Uh, this is one from last year where you have uh, open field, which is white, you have forests, and you have lumber camps. And the lumber camps chase the forests. So you've got this three-state 2D cellular automata that has rules about which things propagate where. And I just played with the settings until all of a sudden my terminal started drawing these giant spiral patterns. And I love how this looks. And all of a sudden I was like, okay, this, this is required to be a puzzle now. I have to build something out of this. And so for most starting conditions, and the way that I built my generators requires this, it, ch it checks for it, every single person's input, if they actually animate it, eventually devolves into this delightful spiral pattern out of nowhere, like a like hundred generations in or something, and it's just wonderful to see. This is a puzzle where you have a bunch of, uh, I think these were asteroids or something? And it says, here's all the starting positions and velocities of these objects. Simulate this through time. Where do they collide? How many of them get left over? And somebody used GNU plot and just gave it all of their points and said, all right, GNU plot, 
What does it do? And Gnu Plot says, Foosh. It's just a lot of fun. So people draw all sorts of stuff. Um, this is the puzzles through 2018. So let's talk about difficulty curves for a second. Um, I try not to make it so that the puzzles take people forever. Uh, sometimes that doesn't always work out. Sometimes the puzzles are way easier for me and the beta testers than they are for most people. It's not common, but that happens. Or sometimes I really, really, really wanted to share a specific interesting thing. And in order to get you to the point where I can show you that thing, I need you to build a lot of rigging. Uh, which can end up being a lot of tedious work. And so for some of it, you get problems that take, uh, so this line halfway down here is 30 minutes. Most of them take about 30 minutes. And for others, for others of them, you get puzzles that take several hours to, to get to the answer, which I'm sorry for, but you know, it's really hard to predict too. Uh, but for the most part, they take the first 100 people who are all competitive programmers who love algorithms you know, about this long to finish. And if they take you longer, that's okay. You should use it for learning and not for speed if you can help it. So let's talk about some growing pains. This, this event is now a third of a million people. Uh, any problem that anyone can have, they have it. Uh, and so there are a lot of things that you have to learn and account for. I like to think of these as learning experiences, though, because uh, that's what they are. So first of all, how do you prioritize tasks? Or tasks spoilers, poorly. Uh, my typical strategy for prioritizing tasks is a thing happens, handle the thing, go to one. Easy. This can't fail, you just do the thing. As long as there's only one thing happening at a time and everything is top priority and that's okay. How do you use pr prioritize tasks if you have hundreds of thousands of users all around the world and all different backgrounds? Well, you do the same thing. It's easy. Thing happens, you handle the thing. Uh, and then while you're handling the thing, several other things happened. And when you try to handle those things, more things happened. And then you never ever sleep and you can't prioritize things and everything's the worst. Um, so you need to actually stop to prioritize things. That's turns out really important at this scale. Uh, you need to ask for help. You need to admit when you're drowning. That's an important skill for everybody. Uh, write better documentation or teach people how to teach people things like the community. If I say to the community like, hey, if somebody's struggling with this, this is the process they can go through. I stop getting emails about that thing because they post somewhere, they ask their friends and everybody else already knows how to do it. Or I have an about page now that has a giant FAQ of like, hey, if you run into this or if this thing happens, you have this question, like here's the answer, but just like, writing stuff down. Having an incredibly supportive community that helps itself. I don't know how to achieve this. It just happened. It just formed. Uh, I'm extremely thankful that it formed and everybody is very, very helpful to each other. I don't, I don't know how to tell you how to do this for your project too. Um, and finally, automation and self-service tools. So I get a lot of requests that do things like, hey, can you merge these two accounts or can you, can you move these stars to this other place or can you do all this stuff? Um, so I had to start writing tooling instead of mucking around directly in the SQL database on prod. Do not do this. Uh, instead, I say, oh, okay, I have a tool, put the things in, make sure everything's right, or it tells me, like, hey, this is going to abandon this private leaderboard, or it's going to abandon these, or these things overlap or something. Make it easier on myself. Um, you get a lot of accessibility things. If you only have, like, your friends doing a puzzle, like, you know, accessibility is... If you've got a lot of people doing your puzzle, accessibility is super important. I like to think about accessibility problems less as, like, oh, an accessibility problem. You have to, I, I think of these as partial outages because that's what they are. There's a subset of users that cannot use your product. It's a partial outage. That's what that means. So if you're having a partial outage where some users can't use some feature, you prioritize it as such and you address it as such. Um, it's really important to constantly be monitoring to make sure that you're covering like the highest standard of guidelines you can possibly find just to prevent people from struggling with things so that it's more available to everybody so that everybody can learn. Um, taking accessibility feedback very, very seriously. If somebody comes to me and says, hey, I can't read this text, it's too dim, or the background here isn't right, or this glow is really hurting me. Like, oh, okay, let me change it or give you tools to see it better or give you some other solution that will let you uh, access this thing. Um, I have a vision impairment. I have a friend that has a, a, a hearing impairment. I have other friends that have other kinds of impairments and, and they all look at it and they all tell me what they're struggling with uh, and just try to make it a thing that everybody can use and learn from and it ends up being a, a, a really important initiative. We deal with denial of service attacks. Why would you DOS a puzzle website? I don't know. We got one of these a few days ago. I, I can't imagine why. Fortunately, I am not opposed to just blanket IP banning whole CIDR ranges of, of IPs. And so if they get bad enough, we just deal with them by black holing a whole bunch of IP ranges. Most businesses don't have those options and they have to do things like give AWS money until it stops. Uh, fortunately, we haven't had to do that yet, but we put up with these on a somewhat regular basis. Very strange to me, like whole botnets. 
I don't know why. Please, please don't DOS my servers. I'm one person. Go DOS something else. Frequently asked questions. Why do the puzzles unlock now? Uh, or, I get this a lot, why don't you make them lock at a different time every day? Then they can unlock like once every hour. Like, because this, this is when I'm awake and not at work, mostly. Like, this is when I can watch the servers, make sure none of the puzzles are broken, make sure everything's functioning. Like, everything's automatic. I could get hit by a bus and the event would still run. But I like to watch, you know, CPU loads, make sure the database isn't getting overwhelmed, be able to scale if I need to scale, being able to fix problems if I need things, or people struggling and help them with that, or you know, lots of different reasons. This is when I'm around. This is when it's unlocking. How long does it take to make 25 puzzles? Uh, five or six months these days. Especially this year, the ink code puzzles took a long time to make. Uh, five or six months of all of my free time. So I have a day job as well, so it's a lot. Uh, can I send you puzzle ideas? Please don't send me puzzle ideas. People, people always send me emails, and like, I have this really great idea for this puzzle that, and I immediately stop re reading because there's a bunch of intellectual property stuff. I don't know where you got the idea for this puzzle. I don't know if it's from a legitimate source. I don't know if you just stole it. I don't want to deal with attribution, having to figure out like, how, to, how to correctly identify like, who wrote each puzzle. I don't, I don't want to deal with it. I have plenty of puzzle ideas. That's not something I'm struggling with. I have pages and pages of puzzle ideas I can draw on. Please don't send me puzzles. If I think an email is a puzzle, or a puzzle idea, I simply won't read it. I'll reply back, hey, I didn't read your email. If it's not a puzzle idea, let me know, and I'll show it to someone and ask them if it's a puzzle idea. Um, please don't send me puzzle ideas. Why is the site rejecting my answer? Typically, typically it's a copy-paste problem. 90% of the time, it's somebody that just didn't copy all of the things out of their input or didn't copy their answer correctly or copied like a bunch of random other characters and pasted the whole thing into, their, into, the, into the website or something like that. Um, sometimes it's a misunderstanding of the problem. Ask, ask for help on the subreddit, do something like that. But check, check your paste buffer first. It's very likely that you just like got a bunch of extra random stuff or that you're not running the whole input or something like that. Does the site lock after getting a wrong answer, or why do I have to wait an hour to submit my next guess? The site does lock after getting a wrong answer. It does that to prevent people from just spamming answers until they get the points for today's leaderboard. Uh, it doesn't lock for an hour unless you guess the wrong answer a hundred times. If you see somebody online being like, Advent of Code is dumb, it blocks me out for an hour every time I submit, they were spamming answers at the puzzle. You should just be sad at them instead. Like, don't, it's not a thing. Um, it, it, it does slowly increase, but it's like one minute, right? Like, it's not a lot. How do some people solve the puzzle so quickly? Or are they cheating? The subreddit loves to claim that people on the, on the leaderboard are cheating. Uh, they're not. Uh, and actually, a couple of the people that are highly ranked on the leaderboard this year have been posting videos of themselves solving it right at midnight. And the technique that they use isn't read the story, read the description, boot up my editor, get a cup of coffee, have a look at the puzzle, think about the answer, ask your dog what the answer is. Like, they don't, none of these things. The process that they use is they're already ready. They have all of their libraries loaded. Their computer is already warmed up and ready to go. They look at their input file first. They read the last line of the puzzle. They skim the puzzle for any nouns they weren't sure about. They guess, and then they get the answer right. They do this thing year-round. This is like the only thing they do for fun. They are very, very fast. You should not do this, but they are that fast. You can go watch videos of them doing this. It's incredible. Like It's, it's a sight to behold. Uh, they are practicing something different than building maintainable software, though. It's, it's fine. Like, it's still super cool, but they're not cheating. They really are that fast. Um, and finally, some stories. Uh, there's a lot of different things that I encounter when doing Advent of Code. I get a lot of, a lot of email, a lot of positive and negative email, both. Um, and I want to just share with you, you a couple of them. So one of these is, as the non-participating mother of a 14-year-old who got up at 4.50 a.m. I'm both massively impressed that people do this and somewhat baffled that nothing else has this effect. I've been reading here so I can make sense of the conversation later in the day. So here's the parent of a 14-year-old who gets up at 4.50 every day all of a sudden and then for the rest of the day is talking about A star algorithms or something and they have no idea what this kid is talking about and literally jump on the subreddit and just read through people's conversations so they can talk to their kid later on which is hilarious to me. Or here's somebody who, uh, I, get, I get quite a few of these, like, Advent of Code helped me get my current job, or Advent of Code helped me get through an interview, or Advent of Code helped my significant other get through an interview, or something like that, which is great, and I'm really, really pleased to see that. Um, I'm also blown away that it has that effect, but I'm, I'm super cool that it's working out for people. Or uh, I get these ones a lot, too. My kids are becoming more interested in coding because of your site. Um, uh, or I have one that I, that I don't have up here that's... Uh, the, the father of, uh, that, that basically wrote to me and he said something like, 
I, I haven't had a good relationship with my 12-year-old daughter. And she saw me working on one of your puzzles. It was the one with the elves and the goblins in the cave that a lot of people really didn't like because it was long and comp complicated, lots of little bits, right? She saw me working on this puzzle and came and sat next to me and we worked on the puzzle together and it helped me start to rebuild my relationship with her. I'm like, are you, are you nuts? Like, what? Like, that's super cool. Also, very overwhelming and it's like, I, I, I can't, I can't handle it. Really cool. So I get emails that are like this too. Um, also, University classes that use it, which is always very weird to me, this is a course that use it as their midterm. <laughs> like literally, like show up to class, welcome to the midterm, do day six. And their final too. <laughs> uh, so in conclusion, engineers in your organization should be solving puzzles for fun. In fact, everyone should be solving puzzles for fun. Thank you. <laughs>